Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game 4. I'm pretty excited about today's video. It's a long time coming. We're going to be comparing the four high-end Android devices that are available today. Now, when I say high-end, what I mean here is anything that's going to be about $250 or more. So these are going to be the ones that you're going to spend a lot of money for, but you're going to expect a lot of good performance and value out of that money as well. If you're looking for something cheaper, then I think the choice here is actually pretty clear, and that for me is going to be the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus. This one came out about two, three months ago at this point, and it cost $150 before shipping, but really about $175 at the end of the day. And I think at that price point, the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus is easily my clear winner here, so we're not really going to focus on this one. Instead, we're going to look at this stuff that's a little bit higher than that. And I think it's really important to compare devices that are at a higher price point because you're probably only going to buy one of them. So you want to make sure you buy the best one available for you. In the end, we're looking at a budget of about three to four hundred dollars altogether to get really good premium Android gaming. And so if you're interested in something like that, I think this is the video for you. And so without any further delay, let's dive in. Before we get started, let me introduce the four contenders that we have today. First up here is the AYN Odin Pro. This one came out about a year ago and was in short supply for most of the year. Thankfully, a lot of the production is actually caught up at this point, so if you order one now, you should get it relatively easily. Now, this one has an older chip inside of it, a Snapdragon 845, but because of the active cooling, it actually performs pretty well, and so we'll take a look at the performance here later. Anyway, that's number one, the Odin Pro. Now, the second high-end Android device to come out in 2022 was this one here. This is the Logitech Cloud. This one actually has an even lower processor than the other one that we just looked at, but it's got some pretty neat features that actually make it really compelling for me. Number one, I love its big screen, and it also has great ergonomics. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Next up, we have a device I just reviewed, the Razer Edge. Now, this one is a $400 device, so it's $100 more than the other ones, but it's probably got the best performance out of all of them that we're going to be testing here today. That being said, it does have some caveats that give me pause, and so we'll also discuss that as well. Anyway, the Razer Edge is number three. And finally, our last contender is the Pimax Portal. Now this one is technically not out yet, which makes it a little bit weird to review and compare against the others because this is a preview or engineering build right here, so not the final model. But I think that it's close enough to the final model that we'll be able to make an assessment at least of what it'll be like until that retail build comes out. Either way, this one has some unique features. For example, it has a controller that attaches like that. That's kind of crazy. And then also it hooks up to a VR headset. We're not going to test that feature here. We're mostly just going to be looking at it as a handheld. But all the same, there's some unique things about this, and so I wanted to throw it in the mix as well. Okay, when organizing the video, as you can see here, I used nine different categories. So we'll briefly touch on each of these as we go through. And then as we get closer to the end of the video, I'll show you a breakdown of my scores for each of these categories. And to start, we're going to take a look at the displays. The Razer Edge has an AMOLED panel, and the Pimax Portal comes with an LCD panel at the lower end version, but if you get the higher end version, it will come with AMOLED as well. And the displays on the Odin and the Cloud are LCD. Now the sizes of these screens do vary by device. The Pimax Portal has the smallest display at 5.5 inches, and then the Cloud is 7 inches, so the largest one here. And the devices will vary by aspect ratio as well. Three of them are 16 by 9, but the Razer Edge is a 20 by 9, which is more similar to something like a smartphone. In terms of resolution, all four of these can go up to a 1080p, but the Pimax Portal can actually go up to 4K. That being said, I wouldn't really recommend using 4K on a handheld like this. It's just going to chew through the battery really quickly. And really, the 4K resolution is meant for when you're playing it in VR when the screen is very close to your eyes. In terms of refresh rate, the top two are rated for 144 hertz although the Pimax Portal in its settings only goes up to 120. And to be honest, other than if I'm playing an Android game that will take advantage of that higher refresh rate, I usually just play everything at 60 hertz anyway. Now in terms of just overall color balance and look of the display, as you can see here, I think that they all look very good. I would definitely say that the AMOLED screens up top have a little bit more richer of a saturation, and the tint on them skews a little bit more towards the red side than green. If anything, I would say that the color profile on the Odin is a little bit too green for my tastes, but that's only really when comparing it against these other screens right here directly. But I think if you were just to play one of these independent of the other, you would really appreciate the screen. These are all four very good displays. 
Let's take a couple other characteristics I like to look at when testing screens. Next, we'll talk about maximum brightness. And I would say among these four, the Razer Edge is probably the brightest among all of them. And it is followed closely by the AYN Odin, although it does get quite washed out at a brighter range compared to the AMOLED screen on the Edge. And then finally, I would say the cloud is brighter than the Pimax Portal. Now, turning down the displays to their minimum brightness here, you can see which one is going to be the best to play in the dark. And then here, I would say the Razer Edge is probably the dimmest among all of them, then followed closely by the AYN Odin. And then I would say the Pimax Portal and the Logitech Cloud. And I found that each of these are pretty good to play in the dark, except for the Cloud. This one's just a little bit too bright for my tastes. Another thing that's important to me as a retro gamer is how games are going to look in a 4x3 aspect ratio on that display. And as you can see, there are varying sizes right here. The Logitech Cloud comes in at about 5 and 3 quarters inches in 4x3 aspect ratio whereas the AYN Odin Pro gets about 5 inches even. But the last two screens here I think are the most interesting because they can both display about 4.5 inches of 4x3 content, despite the fact that the Razer Edge is 1.3 inches larger than the Portal. And again, that comes down to the native aspect ratio of these displays. Having a 20 by 9 aspect ratio on the Edge just makes it longer and not taller. And so really what we're looking at here is the equivalent of a 5.5 inch screen right here, both for 4x3 and 16x9 content. And so while 6.8 inches does sound very impressive when you're looking at overall specs on a sheet, when it comes down to actual real world use case, I find that aspect ratio is way more important than just the raw screen size. For example, here's the Logitech Cloud, which is only 0.2 inches larger of the overall screen size, but because it's 16 by 9, you can see that the display is quite a bit bigger. And so if you're looking for a larger display, I would say don't get tricked into that 6.8 inches on the edge, because it's really not that large. Even something like the AYN Odin, which is only a hair under 6 inches, is still quite a bit bigger than the Razer Edge. And when you compare them side by side, you can see that the Odin is quite a bit smaller than the Razer Edge too. And so when it comes down to it, I find that the 20 by 9 aspect ratio is basically just a waste of space in many regards. Now there are a couple advantages of having a 20 by 9 screen. Number one is that you can play Android games in a much wider aspect ratio if that's something that interests you. But it also makes it kind of handy if you want to do some multitasking. For example, here I'm playing Game Boy Advance at its native 3 by 2 aspect ratio. And I still have the ability to play my favorite YouTube channel here on the bottom right without it actually affecting my gameplay at all. And so if you wanted to do something like play your favorite retro game while also watching a movie in a smaller screen like this, then you could definitely do it on this device. But I would say on a 16x9 device, it probably wouldn't be a very good fit. Okay, that's a look at the displays. Now let's talk a little bit about the audio. I'm just going to let all of these play out and so you can make your own judgments here. So I think when it comes down to it, I prefer the audio on the Razer Edge the most here. It has a really nice balance between clarity and depth. Among the rest, I would say that the audio is not terrible, but maybe the Odin Pro is probably the worst just in the fact that it lacks a lot of bass, but is also quite muffled. Okay, let's move on to one of my favorite things to test, which are controls and ergonomics. We're going to start with the Pimax Portal, because I have a lot to talk about with this one. Now, of course, I've done reviews of all these devices already, so if you want more in-depth coverage, I'll cover that there. But the biggest thing for me here is that I do not like the D-pad that they're using on the Pimax Portal. These are using very clicky buttons, similar to what you would find on a Nintendo Switch Joy-Con, but I would say they are harder to press down on, and then also not designed very well either. If you look closely, they have a teardrop kind of shape to them, which makes them a little bit sharper on those inner edges. And so when you slide your thumb from left to right, it actually kind of catches on that little teardrop edge. Now I suspect the reason why they designed it this way is so that when you detach the controller, you can use it independently like this, much like on a Joy-Con. But I would say for me personally, I plan on playing this thing in handheld mode most of the time, and so that is a feature that I wouldn't actually use. So unfortunately, I found that the D-pad is much worse than I would like it to be in favor of a feature I wouldn't use in the first place. 
Now on the right side, we have the same kind of setup with the face buttons and that teardrop kind of design. And it's gonna be the same thing here. If you're gonna be sliding between the buttons, you are gonna feel that little catch when it gets to that sharper edge. Thankfully, at least for me, when playing with face buttons, I don't typically will just slide across like that. And so it's not as big of a deal as it is on the D-pad. Either way, I'm not a fan of either the D-pad or the face buttons on this machine. Now, like with all the other devices we're gonna be testing here today, this one has an analog trigger input. And these ones feel okay. Again, they remind me a lot of a Joy-Con although I do think that the analog trigger pull here is just a little bit too stiff for my liking. But one nice feature here is that when you press it all the way down, it does give you a little click. And over time, I've actually grown to enjoy that. And that's because it reminds me a bit of the original GameCube controller, one of my favorites from back in the day. So I would say that the trigger and shoulder buttons here are okay, but not great. Finally, when it comes to controls, there are quite a bit of button options. For example, there are four different keys up here that you can use for different menu functions. And then additionally, on the bottom left, we have the traditional Android navigation buttons too. And so I do like the fact that we have lots of different ways to control the Android ecosystem here with these different button options. Finally, when it comes to overall feel and ergonomics, this one reminds me a bit of a hybrid between a original Nintendo Switch and the Nintendo Switch Lite. It has a very similar size and button layout from a Nintendo Switch Lite, but the fact that the Joy-Cons come out does give it a bit of a wobbly quality, much like it is when you're playing an original Nintendo Switch. And so I wouldn't say it's a bad feeling here, but I do hope that the retail units are a little bit more sturdy than the test one that I have here. Either way, it's not an uncomfortable device to hold overall, with exception to the D-pad and face buttons, which I mentioned a minute ago. I found that when I am playing the device, I tend to just favor the analog sticks over the D-pad when I can. And so I find myself playing more 3D games than not because of it. And I should mention here that the analog sticks are just fine. They remind me a lot again of a Nintendo Switch. And so overall, I would say the controls on this device are below average, but the overall ergonomics are fine. Now moving over to the Logitech Cloud, this one has different analog sticks. These stick out a little bit more from the device, which I really like. It makes it feel a lot more comfortable. And overall, these are larger sticks as well. They feel like smaller versions of what you would find on a console's controller. Now, when I first reviewed the Logitech Cloud, we had some issues with snapping to the cardinal points of these analog sticks. And since making that review video, they have made a software update where you can adjust the sensitivity of your joysticks. This you'll be able to find under the main menu options, and now you have five different profiles to choose from. We have everything from the default one to something called high performance as well as smooth. And you can also adjust these independently for each of the two analog sticks. And so going into my gamepad tester, here it is on the smooth setting. And as you can see here, it's not snapping as much to the cardinal points as it did before. But you can also see it's not hitting the four corners. And that's because of that smooth kind of feeling that they're going for with this joystick profile. If we move it over to the high performance one, this feels a lot more sensitive to the touch. And it does still snap to the cardinal points quite a bit. But I would say it's not actually preventing me from touching any of the points on the grid that I want to touch. And additionally, this can reach the corners very easily too. And so in the end, I've come to prefer these analog sticks more than I did when I first did my initial review. One of my favorite aspects is how much they do stick out from the device itself. It is very comfortable. Now, one thing that has not improved, and I don't think it will be, is the D-pad. Unfortunately, the way this is set up, it just feels really mushy and doesn't have enough travel. And when it comes down to it, the light pivot that we get here means that it's very hard to press the diagonals if you want. And so what I found in gameplay is that if I need to hit the cardinal points left and right and up and down, absolutely no problem with that. But if you're trying to play a game that requires a little bit more nuance where you have to hit those diagonals, you'll probably run into some issues. A good example game is going to be Celeste. In this part right here, I'm trying to do up and right diagonals in both of my two jumps. But as you can see here, it's very difficult to actually do a diagonal jump. And so what this means for me is that I've tended to not favor playing any sort of precision platformers like Celeste over time. But when it comes to most other games, especially modern games where you're really just using the D-pad to switch weapons or something else like that, absolutely no problem there. Moving over to the face buttons, these also have a kind of soft touch to them, but I actually like that when it comes to face buttons. I also like that these buttons are a little bit larger than the others too. And so in the end, I do like these a lot too. They're a little bit bigger and lighter to the touch. When it comes to shoulders and triggers, I would say these are just okay. The shoulder buttons have absolutely no problem in pressing down at any angle, so they work great. And the trigger buttons are also analog, but I feel like they're just a little bit too short. Like I wish that they stuck out a little bit more from the case. As it stands right now, they kind of rotate when you press down on them, and it just feels like if I push too hard, my finger's just going to fly right off. Now granted, the button's at a good enough angle here that it never actually happens, but I still always get that feeling if I press down too far. And so if anything, I just wish the trigger stuck out a little bit more. And finally, let's talk about ergonomics with the cloud, because this is one of my favorite subjects to talk about with this device. 
And I think they really nailed it when it came to the contours and overall feel of the grips that they have right here. The device itself has a bit of a teardrop shape to it, which makes it very ergonomic and comfortable to play over long periods. And yeah, I think the overall size of the grips right here is like a perfect balance. They feel nice and grippy, but also don't stick out a ton either. And as I've said in other videos, when it comes to overall ergonomics and comfort, the only handheld I've ever felt that's more comfortable than this is the Steam Deck. Now reviewing some components of my AYN Odin is going to be a little bit weird because I have replaced some of them over time. For example, the analog sticks I'm using here are replacements intended to be used with the Nintendo Switch Joy-Con, but they fit in this one too. And I did a video to show how to replace these, and I do think they are an improvement. And one of the reasons why I upgraded is because the original ones felt very small to the touch. And unfortunately, even with the upgraded new ones, the analog sticks still feel very inset into the device. I think what they did here is they made them too recessed. They were worried about making sure that the device was pocketable, but at the same time, the analog sticks are so low into the device that it's not very comfortable to actually play. And when it comes to playing anything that's got like a dual controller setup, then it just feels like really flat. Now the D-pad on the Odin is actually very good. These are using dome switch connections, so they're a little bit clicky, but they also have a nice loose feeling to them, very similar to the PS Vita. And so I think this is a good D-pad to be used in a variety of different setups. For example, it works really well with platformers and fighting games, but you can also play modern games with it too. Now, same story with the face buttons. I upgraded these ones as well in the same video that I upgraded the joysticks. But really the upgrades didn't do much other than to make the buttons a little bit more shallow and look nicer, and then also they have a more glossy feel to them. At the end of the day, what's holding the face buttons back on this device is the fact that the rubber membrane connection that's used underneath is just a little bit too stiff. And so because of that, it does take a little bit more force than I would like to press down on the button. On top of that, it gives it a bit of a thunky feel, which I don't really like either. And so in the end, I wouldn't say these face buttons are bad, but I can definitely see why they would be improved if I could use a lighter touch on them. When it comes to the shoulder and trigger buttons, I would say that the shoulder buttons are a little bit fragile, but still work just fine. And the analog triggers here are pretty good too. If I had to make any complaints, I would say it gets pretty hard to press all the way down to 100% on these triggers. And they also don't have a very smooth glide to them as well. So they're not very pleasant to touch, but they work and I appreciate the fact that they're analog. Overall, in terms of feel, I would say the Odin is pretty good. It has a rounded kind of edge to it here, which makes it comfortable to grip. And it does come with these two shallow grips right here, which do help with ergonomics a little bit. And when it comes to holding the Odin overall, I would say there's nothing really wrong with it. You can access all the buttons very easily, and none of them are hard to press. And I do think the rounded edges of the device do make it comfortable to hold over long periods. And overall, the device has a nice sturdy feel to it, which I like too. If anything, I would say if the grips were more pronounced, it would be more comfortable, but overall, this is not a bad experience. And finally, let's take a look at the Razer Edge. Now this one does many things very well. Number one, I think that each of the buttons were kind of thoughtfully made. For example, the analog sticks here feel very good. They're much like with Nintendo Switch Joy-Cons, but maybe a little bit higher as well. The D-pad also has a clicky feel to it, but it's also encased in this kind of rounded center. And so because of that, it's very easy to press down on as well. And so again, I have no complaints about the D-pad here. I think it works very well in a variety of different use cases. When it comes to the face buttons, these have a very light touch to them. In fact, it feels a lot like pressing down on a mouse. And so that little click is actually very satisfying and easy to press down. And one of my favorite things about them is that it's very easy to press them quickly. Now, when it comes to these shoulder and triggers, you might think that these are just a little bit too small, but actually in practice, they feel very comfortable. These shoulder buttons to me are just about that perfect size where I can press down on them if I want to, but it's very easy to ignore them as well. And I really like the design of the trigger buttons too. These are relatively small, but they have a good amount of travel to them and they slope up quite a bit too. And in combination with the fact that these triggers are very easy to press down on, I think that's a winning combination. And so I would say among all of these, these are my favorite triggers to press down on. They are small and a little bit light, but all the same, I think they're very well designed. When it comes to actually holding the controller overall, I think that everything is very easy to access, but it does require a bit of a lighter touch. Now on the back, we do have some ergonomic grips right here as it slides into the tablet itself. But one of my main complaints about the controls is the fact that we have this large strip of plastic here along the center. And I found the most comfortable way to hold this is to spread out my middle finger and ring finger so that I don't press that thing in the middle. It is a little bit awkward to spread my fingers like that, but over time I've kind of gotten used to it. Overall, I would say the Razer Edge is a comfortable device to hold, but it does feel quite wide given the fact that it's using a 20 by 9 screen. Okay, now let's get into the software experience. Now it's going to be generally the same for each of these devices. After all, they are Android tablets built into a controller. 
But additionally, each of these devices have their own kind of software launcher. Here's the Odin one here. This essentially allows you to organize your apps how you would like, but it also has some slide bars that you can get from each side. And to be honest, I have not used the Odin launcher that much at all. It just seems like another skin for an Android tablet. For a while, I was using the LaunchBox front end with my Odin, but after this one got very expensive, it just seemed a lot easier to use the Daijisho one for free. And I've made a full walkthrough and setup video for Daijisho front end. I'll leave all that stuff linked in the video description below. Now, getting to this kind of setup does vary by device. For example, with the Logitech Cloud, by default, it has what they call the handheld mode like this. And I think this setup would work pretty well if you only planned on playing Android games and maybe some streaming apps, but there is some things about this that I don't like. For example, when in handheld mode, you can't actually swipe down from the left or right to be able to use Android functions. To do this, you have to go into settings, then device information, and then switch the mode over to tablet. And then after that, it's gonna behave like you would expect for an Android device. And so what we can do here is now set up Daijisho as our front end home launcher, and then we can use it like this. And it's also a similar setup on the Razer Edge, but this one actually already comes in tablet mode, so all you have to do here is just launch Daijisho and you're off to the races. And so I would say among all of these, the setup for this one is probably one of the easiest. And finally, with the Pimax Portal, it also has its home launcher, as you can see right here. And this one also works fully like a tablet as well, so all I have to do here is just launch Daijisho and then I can navigate through my games. And so in the end, when it comes to software experience, I think these are all very similar. It's just a couple extra steps depending on your device on how to get here in the first place. Another handy function that's available in all four of these devices is a key mapper tool. So if you're playing a game that does not have built-in controller support, you can use this tool instead to reenact that kind of function. On the Pimax portal, you would just swipe from the right to be able to activate it, and then from there you just kind of move over all of your buttons to match where you need them. One thing I missed in my original Pimax Portal review, but I wanted to show here, is that if you tap on the right analog stick, it will bring up a settings menu. And within these settings, there are some pretty handy options. For example, you can enlarge the size of the circle to take up more of the screen. But probably my favorite thing is that you can invert either the X or the Y axis for the analog sticks too. And thankfully, the key mapper function within the AYN Odin works very similar to this. In fact, this one has the most settings out of all of them. And so within here, I can do a very similar configuration to my different joystick modes. And then also I can reverse the axes here on the X and Y too. And for me, this is great. That means I can play games like Call of Duty Mobile without having to adjust my gameplay style at all. Now the Razer Edge does have a key mapping function and it works pretty well, but it doesn't have a robust amount of settings changes. So for example, you cannot adjust the analog stick inversion or anything else like that. But if you just want to use it to be able to map the keys on the screen, it'll work in a pinch. And finally, since making my initial review of the cloud, they've also done a software update that allows for key mapping. You can find this within the handheld mode settings under labs. Now, once you've turned that on, all you have to do is hold onto the home button anytime you're in a game and it'll bring up the key mapper function right here. This one's a little bit weird because it shows all the buttons at once when you first turn it on and then you have to move the buttons to where you want them to be and then enable the ones you want to use. But after that, I would say the controls work really well here, other than the fact that it doesn't have a robust amount of settings, much like how it is with the Razer Edge. And so I did find it kind of amusing that the bigger companies we're comparing today, you know, Razer and Logitech, who probably have a lot more staff to work with, they actually have fewer functions than the smaller companies who have less capital and fewer staff to actually throw at the problem. In the end, at the very least, I hope that these larger companies can catch up to the smaller ones someday. Okay, next up, we're gonna talk about performance. There's a lot to unpack here, but I'm gonna to try to simplify this as much as possible. To start, I did run some benchmarking tests with all four of these devices. Even though I'm not a huge benchmark guy, I think these numbers do tell a bit of a story. To start, I did the 3D Mark Wildlife Stress Test. This is a 20 minute test that can test both performance over time as well as battery life. And for this on the far left, we can see that the Logitech Cloud did not perform very well. We got an average of about 1000 altogether. If you compare it to the AYN Odin, you can see that the scores were about half of that. The Odin got an average of about 2140 altogether. Meanwhile, the Razer Edge is a big jump in performance from there because it's using a much more modern chip. But one thing I did find interesting is that on the edge, the very first one minute loop did very well. We got a 4,600 loop score. But after that, we saw a 15% drop down to about 4,000 for the 19 other loops. Either way, this is still about twice as good as the performance on the Odin, so very good. Now the Pimax Portal actually outperformed the Razer Edge by quite a bit. We got about 5,000 on average, which is 20% better than the Edge. But also bear in mind that these were using overclock settings from Pimax that they set within the device before they sent it over to me. And so I'm not sure what kind of overclocking they're gonna be using with the retail units. So this one was kind of pushed to the max. And one of the ways that you can see that this was pushed really far is by looking at the battery life performance here at the bottom. 
For example, starting with the portal here, despite the fact that it performed very well, it ate through the battery very quickly. And so in a 20 minute test that I did here, I saw a drop of 42% on the battery. And what that means in a real world use case scenario is that yes, you can probably get some very good performance out of the Pimax portal, but it's only gonna last maybe 45, maybe 50 minutes altogether. Meanwhile, on the Razer Edge, I only saw a 12% dip in battery over that 20 minute stress test. And so what this means to me is that even if you were gonna play the Razer Edge at very max settings, you could still get close to three hours of battery life when pushed to the very max. Next, moving over to the Odin, we lost about 10% battery overall. That means that we should get somewhere between three and a half and four hours when pushing it to the max altogether. And finally, with the Logitech Cloud, this one only dropped 6% over that 20 minute period. Again, to me, that means that if we were to play this at max settings the entire time, we could still get very close to about six hours of battery life here. Now, of course, when you play any of these systems, you're probably not gonna play them at 100% load the entire time, and battery life is gonna be much better than that. For example, with Logitech Cloud, I've seen it get up to 15 hours if you play some very lightweight gaming. Long story short, my point here is that among raw performance, the portal is probably the best, but you're gonna take a big hit when it comes to battery. And I would say overall in terms of very good performance, but still maintaining a pretty good battery life, the Razer Edge is probably the best here. Now in the end, I don't think that these numbers are the end all be all. I think that it actually comes down to real world use case that makes the most sense for me. And so let's talk about each of these devices in terms of performance and where I see them actually fitting. Starting with the Logitech Cloud, I think this is a very good device when it comes to retro gaming. For example, when playing four by three content, you still get a nice big display. And I think when it comes to retro gaming, everything from like Super Nintendo or Game Boy Advance, and then moving it up to something that's a little bit more intensive, something like Sega Saturn, these are all gonna play great. In fact, I would say all the way up to PlayStation Portable, you can play all these systems with no problem whatsoever. In fact, even with PSP, you can usually play it at a 720p or a 1080p upscale and it'll still play great. Where you really start to run into issues with the Logitech Cloud is gonna be with GameCube and PS2 emulation. I would say conservatively that about 25% of these games are gonna play just well, as long as you don't try to do any sort of upscaling or really push it to the max. And so I would say that the Logitech Cloud is well suited for retro gaming, but maybe not so much when it comes to GameCube and PS2, but you might be surprised and maybe your favorite game will play on this. Either way, I've just never really considered this to be a GameCube or PS2 friendly machine, although it is possible. And finally, when it comes to Nintendo Switch emulation, you can find that some games will play pretty well. For example, SteamWorld Dig 2 or Sonic Mania. Really, when it comes down to it, 2D games are pretty good here on the Switch as long as they're compatible with the emulator. Now moving over to the Odin, we do get quite a bit more power here, and so because of that we will get better performance. And so when it comes to something like PSP, yes we can play this at a 4x or a 1080p resolution for most games. And I would say that most GameCube and PS2 games are playable. I would say maybe 75% altogether, but just bear in mind that you will have to make some tweaks under the hood to make sure your games will play. For example, with GameCube, I prefer to use the Dolphin MMJR fork, which is a little bit more performance minded. And then with the PlayStation 2 emulator, I prefer to use the fast preset, and then I will have to do some underclocking here and there as well. And so I would say the Odin is capable of playing GameCube and PS2 games, but you will have to do some tweaks under the hood and not every single game will play perfectly. In terms of playing Nintendo Switch emulation, this definitely can play more games than the cloud, but you still will probably be limited to 2D games. Now moving over to the Razer Edge, we're gonna have a huge jump in performance here. So number one, you can play any sort of Android game, absolutely no problem here. And the 20 by nine aspect ratio will look pretty good with the games that support it. Moving over to emulation, you can generally just use the mainline versions of most of these emulators. So for example, the vanilla version of Dolphin will play most GameCube and Wii games at a 3X resolution. Same thing with Aether SX2, the PS2 emulator. You can expect to get between a 2X and a 3X resolution for most of these games. Additionally, it's going to be better at playing Nintendo Switch. For example, you can play most of these games in desktop mode instead of handheld mode, and they'll still play at a very good speed. And so really when it comes down to it, the Razer Edge can play most things that Android itself is capable of in the first place. And it's gonna be a very similar story with the Pimax Portal. This one can play the mainline versions of most of these emulators. And so I would expect to be able to play most GameCube, Wii, and PS2 games at a 3X resolution using the normal settings. In the end, if you're looking for very good Android performance, I think the Razer Edge and the Pimax Portal are just about even. Yes, you can get a little bit more performance out of the Portal, but you have to push the battery so far that I don't think it's really worth it. But if you're specifically looking for GameCube and PS2 emulation, I think these two devices are gonna be way better than the others. 
Now, another thing about these handhelds that's really handy is the fact that they're very good for streaming. It's something that's very easy to do while in an Android ecosystem. For example, the Pimax Portal is going to be a great fit when it comes to streaming. It has a 60 by 9 aspect ratio, which means everything is going to fit natively. And then also it has a Wi-Fi 6E chip inside, which means that you're going to get a very stable connection as long as your router has support for it. Now the AYN Odin only has a 5 GHz connection, but all the same, I've never really found a big difference between 5 and 6E, and so because of that, this one works really well in terms of connectivity too. But I will say that where the Odin falls flat is trying to use the dual analog stick controls compared to any of the other devices that we're testing here today. Because these analog sticks are so recessed into the device, it gives you just a very flat feeling and doesn't feel very good. And so among the four, this is the one that I would want to stream modern games on the least. Now the Razer Edge also has a Wi-Fi 6E connection, and so because of that, it'll be very stable as well. But the thing with streaming on this one is that it's not going to take up the full 20 by 9 aspect ratio. Instead, you're going to be streaming to 16 by 9, and so you're going to have wasted space on the left and right. All the same, it is very comfortable to play modern games using these analog sticks as well as the really nice triggers here. But I would say that none of these devices are any contest to the Logitech Cloud. This one is so comfortable to play in this kind of handheld modern gaming mode that this is the one I prefer over the others. Additionally, it has a 7-inch display, which means you're going to be able to see everything much more clearly. And despite the fact that it also only has a 5 GHz Wi-Fi connection, again, I've never really found any issue with that speed. And so, long story short, if I'm going to play any sort of streaming at all, I'm always going to pick the Cloud over the others. Okay, and another category I want to show some demonstrations with are going to be extra features. One of my favorite things about some of these devices is that they have a video out capability. That means if you have a USB-C dock that you could hook up to a monitor, you could actually play this on a bigger screen. I would say among these, the Odin Pro is probably the best in this regard. Not only can this one show USB-C video out, but it also has an HDMI out function here on the top. Now the Pimax Portal is also capable of being docked, so it has USB-C pass-through right here and it looks really good. Additionally, the Razer Edge is capable of doing video out, but you actually have to take it out of the controller to make this work. It does not have video pass-through through the controller itself. Additionally, it's kind of annoying here, but it actually only outputs to a 20 by 9 aspect ratio and not 16 by 9. That means anytime you're going to use video out on a 16 by 9 display like most monitors, you're going to have black bars at the top and the bottom for no real reason. And so for me, I do find this kind of annoying and makes me not want to use video out at all. And then finally, unfortunately, the Logitech Cloud is not capable of video out at all. And so if this is something that's very important to you, you may want to look at the other devices instead. Now, when it comes to other features, something worth pointing out is that the Razer Edge does come out of the controller and that you can use it as an independent tablet. In fact, I found myself using it in this regard to watch movies because it has that nice AMOLED display. However, I've also found that it's not super comfortable to hold because it has kind of sharp edges around each of the corners. But I recently created a solution for myself, and what I did is I ended up using a phone kickstand to apply to the back of the device. And I picked this up for about $11 on Amazon, I'll have it linked in the video description. But essentially what this will allow me to do is prop up the tablet so I can watch my favorite movie or TV show while doing something else at the same time. And here's a look at the box for the kickstand, again I'll leave this linked in the description below, but yeah, it's super sturdy and I really like it. I would recommend when applying it to put the controller on first and then put it as close to the controller and the center of the device as you can. And then make sure the hinge is near the center of the device to give it the most leverage possible. Anyway, yes, I think the ability to use the Razer Edge as a video device is actually kind of neat. Now you could essentially do the same thing with the Pimax Portal because it does have those detachable controllers. However, I found that this one is even more uncomfortable to hold than the Razer Edge. And potentially you could add a kickstand to this one too, but honestly, it's going to get in the way of the VR headset if you are ever going to use that feature. And so in general, I've just found I'm less apt to use this one for video playback than I am the Razer Edge. However, one of the nice things about having those detachable controllers is that sometimes it's more comfortable to hold them this way than actually holding it as a handheld. And so if you are the kind of person that maybe, for example, likes to play your Nintendo Switch with the controllers detached, this might be a good fit for you too here. And then finally, in terms of extra features, you know, the Pimax Portal is the only one that has a full virtual reality setup. Now, bear in mind, you will have to pay more for the headset, and the whole VR setup thing is not quite ready for Showtime just yet. But if you are interested in VR, this might be a handy solution down the line. Okay, so that's kind of my wrap-up of all the demonstrations. Let's talk about the table overall and how I scored everything out. And so let's quickly go through each of these categories to kind of walk through my thinking when it came to giving these scores. To start, when it came to displays, I actually thought these were all very good. However, I did knock down some points. For example, with the Razer Edge, I knocked it down quite a bit because of that 20 by 9 aspect ratio, which I think is just a waste for the type of games that I want to play on it. 
For the Pimax Portal, it probably would have gotten a bigger score as well, but the fact is that five and a half inches compared to the others is very small. The Odin Pro is also a very nice display, but I wish the color balance was a little bit better. And honestly, I really like the seven inch size of the Logitech Cloud 2. And so those two both got an eight out of 10 instead of seven like the others. Now, when it comes to audio, I think these were all very decent, but the Odin Pro definitely sounded worse than the others in terms of lack of bass. And I think that the Razer Edge was a clear winner here as well. In terms of buttons, I think that the Razer Edge got everything right on this one as well. And I think among all of these, only the Pimax Portal was one that I actually found myself not really enjoying. And again, that more has to do with the D-pad and face buttons over anything. I also think the Logitech Cloud was very good when it came to the buttons, with the exception of the diagonals on the D-pad. If it wasn't for that one issue, I think that this would also get a 9 out of 10. Now when it comes to ergonomics, I did give the Logitech Cloud 10 out of 10, because honestly, this is the most comfortable by far to play. Now the others aren't a terrible experience, but I just think that the Cloud is miles ahead of the others. From a software perspective, I think these are all fine. They're basically Android tablets. But I did give the Odin the highest marks, and that's because it has the most robust key mapping software. And over the past year of it being out, we've seen a lot of tweaks to the software from the company. And I think that says a lot about how much they really care and invest into their device. Now, when it comes to performance, I think we've seen in the numbers here that the Pimax Portal and the Razer Edge are quite good. And so if you are looking for that very high-end emulation, those are going to be the two devices to grab. However, that being said, I think the Odin Pro still does a pretty darn good job, and of course the Logitech Cloud is lagging quite a bit behind the others. But that lower amount of performance does come in an advantage in that it has a lower power draw. And so because of that, the battery life on the Logitech Cloud is much better than the others. On average, I would expect about 12 hours altogether. Now the Odin has pretty good battery life as well. You can usually get about eight hours average on that one. And the Razer Edge is pretty good too, between six and eight, depending on how you're playing it. And I think the weak spot here is going to be the Pimax Portal. This has a much smaller battery than the others, and the battery life just doesn't last as long. I would expect an average of about three or four hours, provided that you don't press the device too far. If you do really push it, I would expect maybe an hour even less. Hey, this is Editing Russ. I'm going to jump in here real quick because there's one thing about the battery on the Razer Edge that I forgot to mention that I've learned since making my in-depth review. And that is, if you keep the controller attached and you keep it in standby or sleep mode, it will actually drain the battery a bunch, like 3% per hour. So that is not something I would recommend doing. Instead, you have to detach the controller or you have to just turn it all the way off when you're not using it, which is what I normally do. And so this is not something you can just kind of pick up and play. You will either have to unplug the controller when you're not using it or you'll have to turn it off. Anyway, it's just one mild annoyance and that's why I knocked it down just a little bit more in the battery performance category. Now, when it comes to extra features, I think that the Pimax Portal actually has some really good potential here. Not only does it have the ability for video out and those detachable controllers, which do make it kind of handy here and there, but the fact is that you could potentially use this as a VR headset down the line as well. Now the Odin and the Razer Edge also have their own share of features. For example, I like that the Razer Edge does go into a tablet mode, despite the fact that I think the device overall would be more ergonomic if it was just one solid device. But the truth is, over the past few weeks, I've come to really enjoy using it both as a tablet and as a gaming device. Really, in the end, I think that the Logitech Cloud was the only one I felt that had some missing features. In particular, I wish it had a video out capability. Now, in terms of value, I think this was kind of interesting too, because the base model for three of these is actually around $300 altogether. But I think that that $300 means different things for different devices. For example, with the Pimax Portal, the early bird or entry price is going to be $300. And so I think that's a really good fit for what you're actually getting in terms of power. Now, the Odin Pro is about $300, depending on how much internal storage you order from the company. And honestly, I would say $300 for this device last year was an 8 out of 10 or maybe even a 9 out of 10 easily. But I also feel that that $300 here in 2023 just seems a little bit high compared to what it was last year. It made sense last year when this was the only device that could reasonably play PS2 and GameCube. But now that we have other options on the market, this price seems to feel a little bit more outdated. Now with the cloud, the MSRP is actually 350, but Logitech has been knocking it down to 300 for the past month or so. But I still think that even then $300 is way too expensive for the device that we're getting. If they price this at $200, I would probably give this an eight or a nine out of 10. But as it stands right now, I'm giving it a four. And then finally, the Razer Edge is the more expensive of all of them. It's $400. But I think for the chip that you're getting inside and the fact that you're getting a Razer Kishi controller that already costs $100 on top of it, $400 does seem like a pretty reasonable deal. Now, the main thing I mentioned in my Razer Edge review is that at $400, you can buy other devices like the Baseline Steam Deck for that same price and get more performance and versatility out of that one. 
And so it's just kind of a weird spot where yes, $400 is a good deal for the hardware that you're getting with the Razer Edge, but your $400 could be spent better elsewhere. And then finally, we have our tally of the scores here in the bottom. As you can see, the Razer Edge actually got the most points, then followed by the Odin Pro, then the Cloud, and then the Pimax Portal. And so in wrapping things up here, at this point, we've looked at all the various features for each of these handhelds. We've also assigned them numbers to those features, and I hope that's helped you to kind of pinpoint these things down. But at the end of the day, you're probably still wondering which one I would prefer over the others. After all, I've spent a lot of time with each of these devices, and I obviously have some preferences among them. Now, I was surprised to find that I actually had a hard time picking between them because they're all so very good. But at the end of the day, we had to get down to the truth here, the hard facts. And so because of that, I narrowed it down to two different situations where I think that one of these devices may be better than the others. And those two situations were when on travel and when at home. Now, when it came to playing games at home, I was surprised to find that I picked the Logitech Cloud. Now, this one has its share of problems. After all, it's way too expensive right now. And then also the performance is not great. If you want to play PS2 and GameCube games, the other choices are going to be way better in that regard. But there are many things about this that I prefer over the others. Number one are gonna be the ergonomics. Like I love just holding this device and playing it. And for me, that is a very important factor. On top of that, it has a large screen. Like it's very big, seven inches. And it's 16 by nine, which means that it'll play okay with four by three content as well. On top of that, you know, it can play PSP and below games very well. And honestly, those are the games I prefer the most anyway. The final point about it is the battery life. I love the fact that I don't have to worry about charging this thing every day. In fact, maybe every three or four days I remember to charge it, but other than that, it's not even something I worry about at all. And that's not something you can say about a lot of the other devices we have available here today. And so I get it, this is probably gonna be a little bit controversial, but I love the Logitech Cloud. I think it's a really good device. It's just priced very badly. And I think once it gets to that $200 and $250 price point, it's gonna be a must buy in my book. Either way, when it comes to playing games at home, despite having devices that are more powerful than that, I still chose the Logitech Cloud. Now, when it comes to a handheld for traveling, I surprised myself again by choosing the Razer Edge. Now, this was kind of weird because there's many things that annoy me about it, despite the fact that it got the most points on my spreadsheet. But I learned that a lot of the things that annoy me are things that would apply when you're at home and not on travel. And so, for example, the fact that the video output goes to 20 by 9 instead of 16 by 9 doesn't really apply to me because I'm just going to be using this as a handheld in that regard. And when it comes to travel-friendly features, this one has quite a few. Number one is the fact that it comes out of the controller, and then I can use the kickstand thing that I added to it. Say if I'm on a plane, I can put it on the tray table, and then I can watch a movie without worrying about draining my phone battery at the same time. And so if I don't want to play games and just want to relax and watch movies, which I often do on a plane, this is actually going to be a really great fit for me without having to mess with an iPad or an iPhone or anything else like that. Number two, I like the fact that it has a very vibrant screen. It's going to look really good when both playing movies as well as playing games. Again, things that'll matter to me when I'm on travel. On top of that, it gets very dim and very bright. So no matter what conditions I'm in when I'm traveling around, I'll be able to look at the screen and it'll look very nice to me. Additionally, I think these six to eight hours of battery life are gonna be just about perfect when it comes to using this in a travel scenario, and I can always grab a battery pack if I need to charge it one more time. And so yeah, I was surprised to find that I picked the Razer Edge over the others when it came to traveling. Now, if you're not a traveling kind of person, then probably the other ones might work out better for you. But again, I was also surprised that I picked that Logitech Cloud. Again, I think maybe people who've watched this channel for a while now know that I really like the ergonomics of that device. But all the same, I was surprised to find that I didn't pick the Odin, which is a device I've loved for over a year at this point. Now, when it comes to the Pimax Portal, I'll definitely be covering that again, especially when I get my hands on a retail unit, because I'm very interested to see if it will improve over the others. And I think there's a very real chance that that spreadsheet is going to change when I take a look at that retail version of the Portal. Either way, as I reviewed it here today, I still can't really recommend it over the others, just based on the controls mostly. I, like, I really hate that D-pad, but overall, we'll see how it goes here in the future. Anyway, that's really about it for this deep dive comparison between these four high-end Android devices, and I hope it was helpful for you. And so let me know in the comments below what you think, based on the data that we've seen here in this video here, or your own personal experience, which one do you think is the best? I'm really interested to see those different perspectives. As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.